Thank you so much for watching Landom Sea Goes There. Please subscribe and hit the like button and the bell notification button. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is a 1989 Christmas comedy film, and it was the third installment of the Vacation Film series. It was directed by Jeremy Chesek and written and co-produced by John Hughes. The movie starred Chevy Chase, Beverly D'Angelo, Randy Quaid, with supporting roles by Miriam Flynn, William Hickey, Mae Questel, Diane Ladd, John Randolph, E.G. Marshall, Doris Roberts, Juliette Lewis, and Johnny Galecki. Now more than anything in the world, after the colossal blunders in National Lampoon's Vacation from 1983 and European Vacation from 1985, the well-meaning but ineffectual Clark Griswold wants to have a good old-fashioned family Christmas. However, this year, Clark's noble aspirations for having the ultimate Christmas Eve celebration is blemished by unsophisticated relatives, momentarily defective electronics, and unforeseen but entirely cinematic brushes with the law. Just how hard is it to get into the Christmas spirit and host the ideal Christmas vacation? The movie was based on John Hughes's short story, Christmas 59, which was the second vacation story to be published in National Lampoon magazine. The first was Vacation 58, which was the basis of the film Vacation from 1983. The Christmas story was printed in December of 1980. The label on the home movie reel that Clark found in the attic was labeled Xmas 59, pointing a finger at the original story written by Hughes. However, when later watching the home movie, keen-eyed observers will see that it was from Christmas 1955. Hughes originally brought on Chris Columbus to direct the project, but even before the cameras started to roll, Columbus came to the realization that he just couldn't work with a difficult Chevy Chase after meeting him the very first time. So even though he desperately needed the job at that point in his career, he decided to quit the project. It wasn't worth the trouble. And he really was worried that this might end his career. But then Hughes brought him back in to direct Home Alone in 1990, which went on to become a mega hit earning over six times the amount of money that Christmas Vacation did. Although the movie takes place in the Chicago area, the film was shot in Burbank, California at Warner Brothers Studios. But for a number of the outdoor scenes, they filmed on location in Breckenridge, Colorado, because at that time of year, they traditionally had the biggest amount of snowfall. But when they arrived, the filming crew completely freaked out because they discovered there was no snow at all. So they decided to contract it in. They had a convoy of trucks haul in snow for certain locations. As soon as those trucks arrived, it started snowing, and it dropped a boatload of snow in three days, making it almost impossible to shoot because there was so much snow. With a younger Rusty and an older Audrey, this is the first film in the Vacation series that disrupts the continuity of those characters aging, which really became a running joke in the series from this point on. In the second film, although different actors were cast as Rusty and Audrey, they bore somewhat of a resemblance to the actors from the first film, and that it could be argued that they were the same characters, only older. After failing to get the Christmas lights to work one last time, Clark Griswold takes his frustration out on the plastic decorations in his front lawn. Chase actually broke his pinky finger while punching Santa Claus. He then resorts to kicking and clubbing the decorations after that. They kept the cameras rolling, and that take was used in the film. 
According to Randy Quaid, many of Cousin Eddie's characteristics, most notably the clicking of the tongue, were based off a guy that Quaid knew when he grew up in Texas years ago who had real similar habits to the ones that he portrays on the screen. Now, it's been rumored that Clark's rant about his boss, Mr. Shirley, was all ad-libbed. While this is somewhat true, the cast members helped him along by something that you can't visibly see on the screen. The rest of the cast is facing Chevy, and all you can see is their backs. But what you didn't know is each one of them had a sign hanging around their necks that had one word written on it. All of these one-word adjectives were used to describe Clark's boss and to cue Chevy Chase's memory on what to say during the scene. With this being this director's first really feature film, he was determined not to back down on actors who wanted to exert their power over him. While it's really tempting to think that he and Chevy Chase didn't get along in the production because of Chase's reputation for being hard to work with, Chesick says that they actually had a great relationship on the set. The one person he did have some trouble with was Beverly D'Angelo. They had a lot of arguments on the set. Some of them were described as being very heated, and by the time things were done, there was a lot of bad blood between the two. But that's all changed, and they consider it water under the bridge now. This film has etched a place in our heart in more ways than you can imagine. The term Griswold House soon became part of the American vernacular and it was used to describe a house that's overly decorated in a gaudy fashion. And almost everybody can quote various scenes from the movie. One of the biggest visual representations is that girl behind the counter named Mary. This was that lady's biggest and most endearing role. Her name is Nicolette Scorsese. Now, don't think that she's related to the famed director, Martin Scorsese, because she's not. After her jaw-dropping role in this film, she hung around Hollywood, picking up only a few other roles, but none that stand out in people's memories like this one. Even if a person doesn't know her name, they will likely remember her for being the woman in the store that Clark Griswold was flirting with, and she's also the one that he's dreaming of on the diving board in the non-existent pool in his backyard, ending up completely stark naked, wearing only a smile. She maintains a really low profile, and nobody really knows where she's at now. She does live in California somewhere. At least that's what I've read. Take a look back at this really funny film. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.